is raging all around And even though the waves may rise There is a place of stillness in the storm And you can find it if you will believe It's a soul anchor Hold on to the hope it is a Soul anchor, just hold on to your courage before we call. He answers us with hope. We are so sure of what we're waiting for, and certain of the things we do not see. Told by one who cannot lie, and in this hope is our security. It's a soul anchor, hold on to the hope. It is a soul anchor, and hold on to your courage before we call. He answers us with hope. Psalms verses 1 to 6, and it reminds us of that today. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. 
The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Praise the Lord. Let's come before him in prayer. Oh God, thank you so much that you don't change. That regardless of what comes in our lives, regardless of what the weather is doing outside, or the challenges that we may face, you are always the same. Your care is there for us in every way and in every time, and we're grateful for that, Father. We're grateful that you are our God. You are changeless. Same yesterday, today, and forever. This morning as we come before you to worship, we come before you, some with masks, some without masks, but we come before you knowing that you are the God who reigns and lives and guides. So we thank you today for that, Father, that you are our God, regardless of what situations we face, that you are there for us, holding us, keeping us, strengthening us, and empowering us. As we worship this morning, Father, may our song, may our prayers, may the worship that we provide, that we give to you, be a sweet-smelling offering. Thank you for it. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Sherry, would you like to lead us in our first song?
So come to our time of confession this morning. In a world where people are reduced to who they vote for, what they buy, or what they look like, it's easy to forget that our God, about our God who sees and knows. We can feel lost and alone in a sea of others who also feel lost and alone. We drift wondering if God truly cares for us in our struggles. On those days, breathing takes more effort than we feel we have. Let's hear what God has to say. From Psalm 139, O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down, you know when I stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your presence here and we confess that we have too often forgotten that we are yours. Sometimes we carry on our lives as if there was no God and we fall short of being a credible witness to you. We allow worry, concerns, issues, and troubles to take our eyes off you. In the busyness of life, we forget to come before you with all of the things that we carry. We can be rebellious, Father, ignoring your commands, your desires, and most of all, your heart. For these things we ask your forgiveness and we also ask for your strength. Give us clear minds and open hearts so we may witness to you in our world. Remind us to be who you would have us to be, regardless of what we are doing or who we are with. Hold us close to you and build our relationship with you and with those who have given us honor. Through Jesus' name. Amen. Sure. Amen. Please stand with us.
Our Bible reading this morning is found in Mark 11. We're going to read from verse 1 to the end of verse 25. It's interesting, I just noticed that this morning as I was doing uh, some uh, finishing up study, that there's no Mark 10, or verse 11, verse 26. It skips from 25 to 27. I didn't notice until I was doing some study, uh, some finishing up studying this morning. Let's read. You can follow along up on the screen or in your Bibles. As they approached, no, sorry, not that. I'm going to move to verse 12, not verse 1. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if any fruit, if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say that. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he, and as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called the house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When the evening came, they went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree with, withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourselves into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. May God bless this. His word to our hearts. So how did you look this morning? How many of you got up, or before you left, and maybe went into the bathroom and checked yourself in the mirror? Oh, some of you didn't. You did, Sean, I know. But we, uh, we do that. I mean, it's not wrong, but we do check We do check ourselves in the mirror. We do look and see, oh, and make sure I got, you know, I want to make sure that when I get out in the morning, I don't have a piece of cereal stuck right there. You know, or when you go out in the evening, you haven't got a piece of spinach and this teeth down here. You don't want that to happen. Sherry always has to, uh, when I wash, uh, comb my hair in the morning, she always takes the comb afterwards because she says, I always miss a spot back here. <laughs> so I'm glad, I can't see it because the mirror doesn't show me. So she, I'm glad her eyes are there to make sure she gets that down right or else I would like hideous coming out to church in the morning with hair here that was not quite in the right spot. We often use the mirror to check what we look like. We use it to make sure that we don't have that piece of food where we don't want it to be. Sometimes, or all the time, the mirror that we see, the image we see in the mirror, can't look below the skin, can it? It can't help to see what's inside of us. We may look all nice and snazzy and pretty on the outside, but the inside may tell a different story. The inside may reflect something that's not on the outside. And that's what Jesus is wanting to get across today, as we read here in Mark chapter 11. Now we're spending the next four weeks looking through this last week of Jesus' life, what we normally would call the Passion Week. It started, starts on Palm Sunday with the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and then of course it ends on Friday, uh, Thursday, late Thursday, Friday morning, with the death of Christ. And that's the week of passion. That's the week where we see Jesus' heart portrayed in so many different ways. And the particular incident that we're looking at this morning is exactly that. It brings out the heart of Jesus for people that are around, but mostly it brings out how he sees the, the people of Israel, the Jews, living their relationship with God. And I think in that, we can take things out of this and we go, how am I living my life in front of the world in which 
God has called us to be a part of. How am I living? Do people only see that nice, shiny outside, and the inside, it's not so pretty. Inside, it's a little more ucky. Are we taking care to make sure that the inside is as good looking or as good as our outside? That we're as proud to be able to have people see us for who we really are, not just for a nice mask that we happen to wear on top of our face. Let's take a look at this a little bit more. Now, this is only going to be a shorter series this week. Uh, this, this is only four weeks leading up to Easter. But it helps us to understand a little bit more about what God is doing. Let's see here. Looks can be deceiving. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus says he was hungry. Or Mark says that Jesus was hungry. So he saw a fig leaf in the distance, or a fig tree in the distance, in full leaf, went to check it out, and there was no figs. This is one of the hardest Miracles, means that quotation, that we see in the New Testament. Because it looks like God isn't being fair, or Jesus isn't being fair. Because the, the truth was, it wasn't fig season. That was not what it was supposed to be. Any fig tree, no matter where they were in Israel at that point, would not be in fig. They would not be in fruit. They would still be in full leaf, but they would not be ready to have fruit. And so Jesus walks up, sees this fig tree, and can't get his hunger satisfied, and it looks like, and I'm using that word deliberately, it looks like he gets upset because he didn't get his way. A lot of commentators have scratched their head over this one and go, I don't understand it. We need to connect the fig tree, the cleansing of the temple, and then his response together, because they're all in that reason, they're all together for a purpose. God is trying to point out something about the nation of Israel. And I think when we read about the nation of Israel, we need to remember that God may be trying to point out something in us. That sometimes our looks can be deceiving. Sometimes we may try our best to make sure that everybody sees the right things, but what we see inside is completely different. And the one thing we need to remember when we think about that is that God is the one that sees the heart not the outside appearance. He sees all of us. So when we, no matter how pretty we try to make our masks, no matter how good-looking we try to make ourselves be, God knows what's inside. And we know what's inside. And this is where Jesus is bringing it out. Now, he's not equating us to the fig tree, but we'll get to that in just a moment. So the incident occurred as, as they were, Jesus was moving back from Bethany into Jerusalem, and it's only about a two-kilometer distance. It's not far. And, of course, Bethany was, was the place that he called home for that Passion Week. He would go into Jerusalem, do his teaching, do his stuff in Jerusalem, and then he'd go back to Bethany in the evening. So he had been in Bethany, he had gone through the triumphal entry, gone back, and, back home, and came back. But as he was going out, he goes, Oh, I'm hungry. Bring, wants that fig tree, doesn't find anything, and he curses it. And this is the only time that we see Jesus using a destructive curse in the New Testament. He doesn't use it anywhere else. But again, it must be understood, not just in the context of this one fig tree, but in the context of the temple cleansing, which is going to happen in a moment. That temple cleansing is important. So Mark's, Mark makes the statement. He ends there. But there's one thing that we need to remember, we need to see in this passage, is the disciples heard him say it. So it's not like he said it under his breath and nobody else caught it. The disciples heard it. And it was important for the disciples to hear it because we're going to see that they bring it back up again in just a few moments. All of you know that uh, I'm not a coffee drinker. You know that. I'm not a coffee drinker. I don't know how many of you know why I'm not a coffee drinker. And it's got nothing to do with religion at all. When I was growing up, I loved the smell of coffee. I loved the smell of it brewing. I loved it when I'd go to the grocery store with my mom, and she would grind the beans. The uh, 8 o'clock coffee beans was her favorite. And so she would, at, at A&P, at A&P, well, we don't have A&P anymore, but anyways, she would put it underneath the thing, and I'd just like go, oh, that smells so good. 
and they would burn, they would have their percolator perk going, and, and in the morning, and it would, oh, it smells so good. I can't wait till I'm old enough that I can try this. So I was maybe, I don't know, 13, 14, 15, somewhere in that area. I thought, this is it. I'm going to try this. I'm going to see if I can join the ranks of an adult and drink coffee like my mom and dad. So I took a mug of coffee and I put some sugar and some milk inside of it. I didn't know what I was doing. And I took a taste and I thought I was going to die. Amen, brother. I thought I was going to die. That was awful. I thought somebody had changed it. This isn't the smell that comes out of that, that bag. This isn't the smell that comes out of the, perk, the coffee perk, is it? It was awful. So I thought, well, maybe it was just the first time I tried it. Let me try it again. So I took another taste. It was just as bad. Just as bad. The reality was is that the taste didn't, for me, no, not for everybody else, the taste didn't equate the smell. And I never touched a cup of coffee again. That's because you put milk and sugar in it. You just had straight coffee. Oh, I think if I had put straight coffee, it would have been worse. <laughs> I think it would have been worse, Jen. <laughs> I think the, the sugar and the, and the cream kind of watered it down a little bit. But when I think about that, I think about what Jesus did to the, to the tree. It's not that the tree was bad. It's not that the tree was some kind of an example. It's that Jesus wanted to make the tree an example. He saw the tree there. He saw that it had nothing, even though it looked so promising, and yet there was nothing there. There was no fruit on that tree. And he was in Jerusalem, and he was seeing the people, because if we remember just the day before when he made his triumphal, triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he had, he had shed a tear as he looked as they were about to come down the hill into Jerusalem. He looked and he saw them going about, everybody going about their business, and he goes, they're, they're like, a, like lost sheep. And he cried for them. He saw the state of the nation of Israel and he weeped for them because they were like, like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus looks to the most important thing that they had, and that was the temple. And he saw the temple in the distance, the fig tree that had no figs, the nation of Israel and how they were lost. And it was that, it was in that larger context of the nation of Israel and the lostness of them that he saw this fig tree and he realizes that the nation of Israel was much like the fig tree. Much like the fig tree. Lots of green. Lots of active, lots of what looks like positiveness. Positive, positivity. Yet no fruit. There was nothing there. There was nothing there as they were called to be the kind of people they were called to be. We need to see that in conjunction with what we're going to take a look at next. Because actions can be misleading. Action can be misleading. Sometimes we can be so busy doing something. Let me ask you this question. What do you think is, is one of our uh, biggest problems in our society today? Anybody? Busyness. We're busy. People say, well, so when do you have time to do something? Oh, I'm too busy today. I can't do it. How about next week? No, I'm too busy then too. How about 10 days from now? No, nope, too busy too. I've got too much on my schedule. My calendar's going, going, going. How many times do we always, our, our calendar, our schedule determines what we can do or what we cannot do? We think, well, the more busier I am, the more important I look, therefore, the better I feel about myself. The nation of Israel was a busy nation. A lot was going on. As Passover was beginning, they, there was a lot of activity going on in Jerusalem. People had traveled in from a distance, and as they traveled in from a distance, they had to go about their activities. And of course, the temple became the central part of it. The temple had a lot of activity going on. There was the money changers. There was, the, there was the, those selling uh, doves and, and other animals and livestock. All in the temple. And Jesus saw all this action and go, wait a minute, there's a problem here. So that's when he entered into the, to the, the uh, entered in, and he drove, began driving out those who were selling, buying and selling there. He overturned the tables, and he wouldn't let people travel through it. The church, or the temple for him, 
had become something that it was never, ever meant to be. It was busy. It was active. There's a lot of things happening. And people go, wow, isn't this great? Look at all the people that are here. But the reality of what, what they were supposed to be doing, they weren't doing. What they were supposed to be engaged in, they weren't being engaged in. So we talk about this particular example here. And the first thing he does, he drives out the money changers. He overturns, or he drives out, the, drives out people with the, uh, he drives the money changers and he takes care of those who are selling livestock. And then he stops people from traveling through. Each one of these has an important task. The temple was made up of different sections. There was uh, the court of women, there was the court of Gentiles, there was the, the holy place, and then there was the most holy place, the holy of holies. Now, the most holy place and the holy of holies, nobody could go into. The holy, holy of holies only went, the, only the high priest would go in one time a year, and that was it. But if the Gentiles wanted to follow and have a relationship with God, the only way they could do that in worship was to come to the court of the Gentiles. And in the court of the Gentiles, it was so grand with people selling, people trading money, and people traveling through it and using it as a shortcut from point A to point B, that the very thing that God had called the nation of Israel to be was lost. The busyness and activity of the time had crowded out the importance and the purpose of what God had intended that particular space to be a part of. Now, was it wrong? Was it wrong for the money changers to be there? Not necessarily. Was it wrong for them to be selling livestock in there for people to, to, uh, uh, to buy for their, their, um, their, their uh, offering? No, it wasn't. People weren't, they had to travel from a distance. They didn't want to take the risk of bringing something from home that was kosher, bringing it into the temple, and then all of a sudden the priest says, oh, sorry, that's no good, and then they're stuck. Then they have to go and find something somewhere. So they had people in the temple. Someone said, hey, why don't we do this? And they did it. But in order to also to pay the tax that was required, the money that they would have in commerce, which was Roman, they would have to do something different because they would need something a different currency to give their tax, their temple tax. So they would come in and they would offer, they would say, I need to have my money changed. Sounds like a good thing to do, doesn't it? Buy your, you know, one shop stop, one stop shopping. Buy your, your offering, get your money changed to make, pay your tax, and everything's good. Sounds right, doesn't it? But the busyness of the temple, the very fact that there, it was basically a market had become and taken away from the importance of what God wanted the temple to be. So Jesus uses two particular quotes here. He uses the he uses the quote, excuse me, he uses the quote from Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, and he's, and which says, verses 6 and 7, and it says this, And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without disagreeing it, and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable, accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. They could only go to one place, the Gentiles, to do this worshiping. That was the court of Gentiles. That's the only place. So they would go in to do it, and there was no room. They'd go in to do it, and they had to put up with animals bleeding in the background. They could go in, and there was no place that, because the money changers were there trying to get the best deals. Jesus said, this is not what it was intended. This was not what was supposed to happen. The outward look was deceiving. They had changed the focus of the temple from a house of prayer into a den of thieves. Along with the idea of selling goods and changing money, enter greed. Hannah and Cameron would love to be able to have a house they can't afford it. They keep on saying, well, it's because of, and they point their finger at this, that, and the other thing. And he said, you can't legislate greed. Greed is greed. People are going to want more. So the, the leaders would set these things up, and they'd say, you take whatever you want as your payment. So somebody would say, take a, a dollar, say, and they want to go from American to Canadian. Let me use that as an example. 
And they would say, for your American dollar, I will give you 75 cents Canadian for your American dollar. Sounds like the bank, actually. But they'd say, well, you know what? I want a little more this week. So no, for your American dollar, I'm only going to give you 50 cents Canadian. And they'd say, no way, I'm going to go somewhere else. Well, guess what? They'd go over to this stand, and they'd say, I'll give you 50 cents Canadian for your American dollar. They were stuck. They couldn't do anything different. They would go to buy a chicken, or not chicken, a dog, but they'd go to buy an animal to offer, and they would inflate the prices. All of a sudden, this place that was supposed to be dedicated to worshiping God was now being used to take advantage of the very people that God wanted them, God wanted to be worshiping. You see why Jesus would be a little upset? You see why he would get a little ticked off? And it was in light of this that we bring in the fig tree. Because Israel was, that became an example of what Israel was to be. This fruitful, wonderful, luscious tree that would make a difference in the world around them. And then the temple was right there, starkly in, in, in contrast, where they were make, making money on changing money, making money on selling goods. They were stopping people from being able to worship God. The very things that God wanted them to do, they weren't. Outward activity can be deceiving. In our own lives, outward activity can be deceiving. We want to be able to accomplish something. We want to be the people God wants us to be. But we fill up our time with things. We fill up our, our time with activities and energy. And we're running from this place to that place, back and forth. And see how busy I am? See how important I am? See how good I am? Because I'm so busy. God says, no, there's no fruit. The things that I devised, that, that I had for you, you aren't doing. So that brings us to the next day. Jesus went home, and as he was doing so, he said, the, 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 Peter, the disciple said, hey, look, there's the fig tree, dead. Not just withering, dead. Gone. No life in it. Jesus doesn't respond. But yet he brings out some points that are so important for us to understand. He talks about three different aspects here. He talks about the source of power. He talks about our faith. And he talks about connecting with God. That was the whole idea of what the temple was there for. That was what God had imagined and envisioned for the temple to be. A place where they could see who God was and see his power at work. A place where people's faith would be strengthened as they made a relationship, as they developed their relationship with God. A place where their faith, where, their, uh, where they would connect with God in a powerful and wonderful way. God wants these things out of our lives too. The problem is that we've let a lot of stuff come in. We've let stuff enter into our lives. And we have to ask ourselves, who do we see as the source of our power? When Jesus spoke, that fig tree withered. It was dead. Dead. Because he's the source of power. He's the one that has the ability. But we need to connect with him. Then he talks about faith. He says, he talks about it, he says, I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that it will happen, what they say will happen, it will be done for them. As Jesus stood there on the Mount of Olives, in the distance he might have been able to see the, sea of, or the, uh, the Dead Sea. And his mind would have gone, mountain, sea. If you can take this and throw it in. Now the reality is, is that Jesus never expected anybody to take him swoop up the Mount of Olives and dump it into the Dead Sea. That was not the intention of what he wanted to do. But he wanted them to realize that when you trust in God, when your faith is solely in him, not in the ability to make money, not in the ability to be this, to do that, to be there, to have this, to look that way, to do this thing, then you recognize the power is really there. Too often as believers, we place more faith in how we look 
We put more faith in the things that we can do. More faith in how much money we have. More faith in how good we see. Rather than in God and God only. That we miss being able to really worship Him and honor Him in our world. The Israelites were never expected to be super people. They were expected to trust God. God never expects us to change the world. We often think, well, I've got to go and change the world. God never expects us to do that. He expects us to honor Him. He expects us to follow Him. He expects us to trust Him and let the rest take care of itself. That's what He says. If you have a little bit of faith, the mountain will go into the sea. Period. When he continues on from that, he says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have it, and it will be yours. And when you are standing praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. So God is the source of our power. God is the object of our faith. And prayer is the way we connect. As much as I enjoy having people come to, sun, to worship, worship on Sunday morning, as much as I enjoy Bible study that we have on Wednesdays, I, and those are, I enjoy it because I like to teach. However, the most important aspect of our life is not coming to church on Sunday morning to hear a message or coming to Bible study on Wednesdays to participate in Bible study. But it's the time we connect with God. At home, here on Sunday mornings, Thursday afternoons when we gather together, when we connect with God, that's what's important. That's what allows us to be able to recognize who God is. When we connect with God in our times at home by ourselves, we are able to allow Him to work in us and speak to us. You see, we can be authentic with God. We can take the mask off because God knows us. We can put it off to the side. We can allow God to see us and begin his wonderful transforming power in us as we pray. He does give a couple of provisos, Jesus says. The first proviso, or the first condition, is that we need to trust God. Throw that mountain into the sea. And we need to forgive. We need to forgive. So as we come towards Easter, we need to do a soul check. A soul check. God, how's my soul today? In a few moments, we're going to close. At the end of the service, we're going to close with uh, a favor of mine. It's well with, your, with my soul. And Horatio Stafford wrote this song as he was traveling from North America over to New York, over to England. And he had fallen in the footsteps of D.L. Moody, and he was going over to be joined D.L. Moody. And he had sent his daughters ahead early. And as they were crossing the Atlantic, a storm had come up, and the ship that they were on was sunk, and they were lost. And he, of course, going over uh, afterwards, was crossing the same spot and asked the, the captain of the ship, to let them know where they were when his daughters died. And they did. And he stood out there on the gunwale of the ship and penned the words, when peace like a river attend them my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And as we come to Easter, my friends, it's not about making sure everything is perfect looking. It's about being able to reiterate those words that Horatio Spafford said, that it is well with my soul. I trust in God. I connect with him in prayer. I have faith to believe in what he's going to do. That is our first soul check. How is, what is my mask? What am I wearing? And I can take it off. Let's pray together. Father, 
I can't even begin to understand what perhaps the author of that hymn thought as he was crossing that same spot that his family was tragically killed. And I don't know if I would ever be able to have the same faith and trust in you to be able to say, it is well, my soul. And I hope that never happens to any of us. But I pray, Father, that this week, as we, this, these next few weeks, as we prepare for Easter, that we may do those soul checks in our own lives, knowing that we're not going to be condemned, knowing that we're not going to be sent out, that, we wouldn't, that we're not going to be discredited, Jesus is going to cast us away. That we can get our soul in the spot where we can say it is well with my soul. As we come to Easter, Father, work in our hearts, work in our lives. May we see you actively doing your work in us so that we may be the people and we might be the church that represents you towards in our community. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sherry, Ben, would you guys lead us in a song of response?
meet us so wonderfully in that. We come before God, it brings us to Him. In our time of prayer this morning, what things can we praise God for? What things can we pray for today? Mark. As it says, Mark, thanks. We'll pray for pray for Ruth and her family as they grieve. Other things we can pray for? Joanne? I just want to praise God for Wednesday and Thursday services. Okay. Thursday night services. Okay. Thursday night services. We have some good time on Wednesdays yeah. and Thursdays as well, don't we? We've had some great time, great discussions. <laughs> A lot of, all over the place sometimes. So wonderful. Uh, Jenny uh, came through her surgery on Monday really well. Uh, they took off two and a half liters of fluid out of the cyst that was on her liver. Uh, seven pounds worth as well. So she's recovering well. She was back on Monday night, and uh, so she's hoping that uh, as she continues to recover, she'll be able to get back on with life again. They were, there was a lot of stuff that they took out, three little arthroscopic holes and she was home that night so I know they're very grateful for our prayers last week so we do definitely continue to pray for them but we great you know, give thanks to God for that Stacy um, my brother's best friend died she's your brother brother's brother's best, friend? best friend died she's 41 cancer so mm, what's his name going through a hard time uh, it's the frame family frame okay and also always the park house family that's a tough one at 41 Absolutely. Jim. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, possible for four months and stuff. Fell and he fell, tripped yeah, and broke his so he said plates and screws and all sorts of hardware in his ankle, so. And, and of course, you know, David is, is blind, so can't see. Other things we can pray for, Sean? Uh, I just um, still having a hard time getting, uh, they're trying to process my diploma at Bible College, and also uh, get my transcript ready, but there's a big hold up and everything. It's been going on for a couple of months now, so. Right. I'm gonna get that done, so. Right, definitely take that. Red tape will be taken care of. Okay. A prayer and a praise. A prayer and a praise. Okay. Um, I was talking to my sister yesterday, and the lump that they took out of her breast, she no, they took out lymph nodes as well, and the lymph nodes do not have cancer, so she was very, she wants to thank God for that. But continue to pray for them as she mourns the loss of her son. Yeah. And what was her name again? June. June. No. So cancer surgery and it's loss of her son. All right. Can we remember Donna Young? Donna's, yes. Donna's 92nd birthday was on Friday, and of course she couldn't celebrate it because they're in lockdown. No. Ten cases apparently at uh, COVID at Goddard Place. Well, 92, we, are celebrate, we celebrate with Donna even though she, we can't see her. Uh, 92 years old, and uh, Fred's 96, so um, two of them are just a wonderful couple. Uh, a wonderful couple. So we'll definitely pray for her and for all that's going on over there at Goddard Place. That's what I was just going to say. Goddard Place has a lot of COVID. Yeah. Because one of the girls that works with us, my company, um, 
just told me there's at least 20 cases and six oh. staff members. Wow. Is the residents affected, do you know? I mean, they're all affected, but did, they, did some residents get COVID as well? Yeah, 20. 20? She said yesterday. Oh, my goodness. That's, six staff members. That's, that's something. Let's come before God, shall we? Let's bring these things to the prayer. Father, we um, we're kind of, I'm humbled when I think of the number at Goddard's place. I was only there a few weeks ago. I went in and visited, and then there, the, the regulations are pretty tough. We don't recognize, and we think that because we're taking our masks off, because things have been restricted or relaxed, that perhaps this is the past, but no, maybe it's not. It's still there. And we do pray for Donna and Fred, and we pray for the staff and the, the folks over at Goddard's Place, because it's real, and they're paying the price over there for whatever happened. We pray, Father, that you'd be with them as they are again locked into their rooms, can only go out uh, for a short walk outside. Um, people are, are sick, residents are sick, staff are sick. Father, we pray that your presence would be with them and allow them to all heal well and get back on with life. But we do pray, Father, that the necessary precautions will be taken. And that reminds me, and it humbles me, because sometimes we can think, oh, it's gone. But it's not. It's still there. Father, I do want to pray for others. I think of Phil, who was uh, sick as well this week. He just said, uh, didn't want to spend any time here yesterday. But just dropped off stuff and went home. Father, we pray for him, and we pray that you keep, keep him safe as he uh, recovers from whatever's ailing him. We think of others that are struggling. We think of June as she deals with cancer, and whatever the response is going to be to the stuff taken out of her chest, and also uh, dealing as she deals with her son's death. We pray for Jenny as she recovers. We thank you for a good, a good surgery, good re response, we do pray that her recovery goes just as well. We pray that you continue to walk with her, be with her as she walks through these. And we know, Father, that you work in powerful ways. Father, we think of in June, and we think of Ruth Ann and families who are grieving. We think of uh, the Frame family, as they deal with the loss of son, 41. Wow, that's tough. Father, be with these families that are grieving, feeling the, the sting and pinch of death in a very real, real way. May your comfort be a part of them. May, may your comfort and your, your peace dwell over them so that they may know that, that in the midst of the grief, in the midst of the grieving, that God, you are there in powerful ways. May you bring people into their lives that will reflect the grace, the grace of God the power and the love of God in those situations, that they may see Jesus through it. Father, I also uh, want to pray for David as he continues to recover from uh, a really bad winter, uh, recover from surgery, recover from hospital, four months in the hospital with his leg in pieces. We pray, Father, that you help him to get back up and get his strength back up and be able to move around again. We thank you for his, uh, his faith. We thank you for the way he cares for Flora. Thank you for the care that you've given both of them during this time. But we do pray that your hand will be on, them, on him as he recovers. Father, we do, want to, we do want to thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for things like what you did in Jenny's life this past week, what you're doing on Wednesday nights, Wednesday afternoons, a Bible study, and the time we spend together. Those are all great things that you're doing. And we pray, we're thankful for what you're doing. Father, always let us remain vigilant especially as we come towards this Easter season, that we would remember that it's easy for us to get complacent. The nation of Israel did it. It's easy for us to just sort of go about the busyness and the activities. Let us be diligent in coming before you in prayer, diligent in studying, diligent in learning about who you are and what you want us to do. Father, thank you for that. Father, I thank you for... Uh, Sean, I thank you for the work that he wants to do and the ministry he wants to perform. Uh, take away those roadblocks that are holding him from getting his diploma. Allow those things to come through so we can, he can move on in his next phase, phase of his ministry life as well. So, Father, we thank you for that. Thank you for the work that you do amongst each one of us. 
And we ask, Father, that as we, we move into this week ahead of us, that you would continue to guide us and strengthen us and move us in the direction you want us to go. Thank you for that. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Our announcements for this coming week. Uh, we're so grateful for uh, uh, great for those who were here on Saturday downstairs. We got some walls put up. Jim reminded me some reminded me of something that we missed, so we got to fix that up. But that's okay. We're 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 uh, trying our best. But uh, we had a good time downstairs. We got a lot of work done, and uh, the plumbers will be in this week to hopefully finish up the work that needs to be done, and then we can have everything inspected and start moving along further. So if you like, go down and take a look at it downstairs. There's, it's looking really quite nice down there. It's coming along. We're grateful for it. Um, Bible study will be on Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock downstairs. Uh, actually, Wednesday afternoon will probably be upstairs here because uh, the plumber will be working downstairs. Hopefully. Hopefully. But hopefully we'll have Bible, we'll have Bible study either up or downstairs. So come on in. And then Thursday afternoon we'll be having prayer at 3 o'clock as well. Um, Good Friday service. Pardon me? Yes, thank you. Thank you for reminding me of that, Sean. Uh, we're having a, a combined Good Friday service with Bethel Pentecostal and uh, Trinity Church, and that will be on Good Friday, the 15th of April, over at uh, Knights Columbus Center, 10 o'clock in the morning. And it's going to be a great time together. So we invite you to be all a part of that. It'll be a good, a good morning service, one that we haven't done for a couple of years because of COVID. And it's always a, a wonderful celebration when we get together on that day. Yes, Mark? We're just on Good Friday. We're out at the Knights of Columbus Center, uh, out in Parsons Court, and we're meeting with three other, two other churches together. Just on Good Friday only. Sunday will be here. Easter Sunday will be here. Okay. I think that's all the announcements for this morning. Dorothy, do you know anything about this? Okay. Thank you. Let's uh, let's come to continue our worship as we prepare to go out into the world in which God's called us. Sherry, lead us. In our last song, it is well. Please stand with us.
Father, our prayer is, it is well with our soul. But you're the only one that can examine us. You're the only one that can look inside of us. You're the only one that can confirm that. So this morning and this week and this month, as we look forward to Easter, may you work in us. May you guide us. May you direct us in such a way that we can with confidence say it is well with my soul. Father, take us out from this place today. Take us out into the world in which you've called us to be. Take us out as people who, are, who long to be like you and to see our world changed for your, with your goodness, with your grace, and with your mercy. Guide our steps, Father. Go with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.